We're back at it again, guys, because as we all know, nothing goes better together than horror and history. And yes, I'm including both peanut butter and jam in that equation, because the horrifying tales of European history are just too damn good to pass up, particularly when it comes to sandwiches. As we briefly touched on in the first part of this series, Europe is a mystifying place, filled with more torturous tales of intrigue, deceit, superstition, and just plain old misfortune than a George R. R. Martin novel, because after all, he knows more so than anyone that truth is always stranger than fiction. You gobbled up part one, but there's many more where that came from, so let's take a look, shall we? Hello horror fans, what's going on? And once again, welcome back to the Scary Channel on YouTube, top five scary videos. As per usual, I'll be your horror host, Jack Finch, as today, we curiously take a look at the top five creepiest tales from European history, part two. Roll the clip. Arthur, daughter of the house of Vida, this high court of the Inquisition of Moldavia has declared you guilty. For the curious amongst you, that scene was from Mario Bava's 1960s Yalo gothic horror, Black Sunday, otherwise known as The Mask of Satan or Revenge of the Vampire, because as Italian horror cinema has a fine habit of portraying, European society throughout the medieval period and beyond was hella messed up, and there's nothing more terrifying than a persecution of witches and an Iron Maiden mask slammed to the face. Right? Yeah, I thought as much. I guess we better go on with the show. Kicking off at number five, an ancient Greek haunting. And this tale is just straight up awesome and may in fact be one of the earliest known recordings of a ghost story in European history. And it's a tale told by the legendary Roman author and politician Pliny the Younger way back when in 72 AD. And it concerns a particular haunted house in the Greek capital of Athens. In the city there was a large attractive house that had remained a mystery to the local people as to when and where it had been built and thus garnered a disturbing reputation. At night, anyone sleeping inside the building heard strange groans and creaks, and sometimes in the dead of night came the rattling of chains. Because of its reputation, it had changed hands through a string of owners. No one wanted to be afflicted by its paranormal goings on. So came a Greek philosopher named Athenodorus, a highly rational man that didn't believe in ghosts and could spot a bargain at the same time. Despite the warnings and the house's terrible reputation, he brought the house for a fraction of the price and moved on in. On his first night there, after an evening of drinking and reading, he of course began to hear the strange sounds of the restless spirit, and after a while, Athenodorus looked up to see an emaciated old man peering straight at him with chains bound across his wrists, violent wounds across his body. Undeterred, Athenodorus realised that the ghost wanted him to follow him, and so he did. It led him to the house's garden where suddenly it stopped and the chains shattered to the floor and dissolved in front of his very eyes. As the legend goes, the next morning Athanodrus ordered a few men to dig up the garden and in exactly the same spot that the spirit had led him the previous night was the skeleton of a man, still with chains bound around his wrists. Athanodrus arranged for the skeleton to be buried in the conventional way and from that day forth, the spirit was never seen again. Wow. That's one way to do it, right? Coming in next at number four, the lady with the goat feet. And we're continuing this series with a tale from that mysterious place known only as Portugal. Now, the history of Portuguese culture is just straight up fascinating either way. The oldest state on the whole of the Iberian Peninsula and perhaps one of the oldest in the whole of Europe with a rich history of the Carthaginians, Romans, Celts and Moors. And because of that, Portuguese folklore history is ripe with a little bit of everything. As the legend goes for this one, first compiled in the Lendas e Narrativas by Alexandre Herculano, a Portuguese lord by the name of Don Diogo Lopez was hunting in his lands when he ran across the most beautiful lady that he had ever seen singing out in the field. Instantly he fell in love and promised her all the riches in the world if she married him. She accepted but with one condition, he could never make the sign of the cross again. As Herculano goes on to portray, it was only when Don Diogo returned with his new bride that he realised there was something different about her. You see, she had forked feet in the fashion of a goat. Hooves. Not one to be deterred, Don Diogo shrugged his shoulders and the pair lived in happiness for many, many years, where they had two beautiful children, Inigo Guerra and Dona Sol. One day though, after Don Diogo had returned from a successful hunt, he awarded his prize hound with a bone, but his wife's dog, a large black demonic looking hound, burst into a fit of jealous hunger and ripped apart Don Diogo's dog in a violent rage. Shocked by such incredible evil and gore, Don Diogo blessed himself with the sign of the cross, and in that moment, his wife, the lady with the goat feet, let out a hypnotic screech, screamed, and floated 
into the air. And then her young daughter, Donna Sol, did the same, and the two women were never seen again. Now, obviously, there is a lot of allegory of religious tones to this story in particular, but it does pose the interesting question where the hell is this story's origin rooted? Next up at number three, Bishop Thietmar of Merseburg. And outside of everything else, this guy in particular was an incredibly interesting individual and an important chronicler of the ancient kings and holy Roman emperors of Europe. He was born of royalty but only ever as a prince, and so he made a life documenting the comings and goings of the kingdoms. Because of that, he also came across some pretty bizarre paranormal occurrences, and this one is perhaps his best. As Thietmar was informed by his niece, the Abbess Brigadia, a priest had been given proceedings of an ancient church in Utrecht that had fallen into disrepair but had recently been renewed and consecrated by the local bishop. One day at dawn, the priest saw what he could only describe as dead people making offerings in the cemetery and the church and could also hear them singing in the pulpits. Disturbed, he asked the bishop, a man named Baldrick, what he should do, and much to his dismay, he was ordered to sleep throughout the night in the church so that he could rest wrestle it back from the dead, but on the following night, both he and his bedding were thrown out into the cold by a supernatural force. Obviously, at this point, he was terrified, and so he complained again to the bishop. Again, though, after being blessed with saintly relics and sprinkled with holy water, he was continued with guarding his newly consecrated church and ordered not to leave until the dead had been put to rest. But after not sleeping, a wink, wide-eyed in terror, just before dawn rolled back around again, suddenly the dead dead lifted up the priest's body, placed him before the church's altar, and burned his body to a fine ash. The bishop, after hearing the news and confused by the matter, ordered the whole town to penance with a three-day fast so that he could aid the souls of the departed. In his final writings, Bishop Thietmar stated in this case, as the day to the living, so the night is conceded to the dead. Swinging the next at number two, Anacido. And this story is weirdly terrifying, if not one of the most unfortunate cases in European history that would perhaps put Henry VIII to shame. And it involves a German prince named Joachim II and his favourite hunting lodge, the Jagdschloss Grundelwald, the oldest preserved castle in Berlin. Now, Joachim loved hunting so much that he'd regularly throw three day long festivals to celebrate the thrill of the hunt, and Grunewald soon became his go to spot, where he'd hide away from the responsibilities of rulership. In fact, he was so smitten by the place that he allowed his mistress, Anna Sido, to live there in secrecy, much to the dismay of his second wife, Hedwig, daughter of the Polish king Sigismund I. Now, obviously, things were a little bit awkward, but in an attempt to win her husband's favour, Hedwig decided to tag along with his thrill for hunting, and so Anna, in this respect, was often sent away to avoid any confrontation. But during one particular stay in the lodge in the year 1551, the rotten floor beneath Hedwig and Joachim collapsed and broke away. Joachim was incredibly lucky and landed between the beams without any injury, but his wife Hedwig wasn't so lucky and she plunged through the depths. She shattered her thigh on the rafters and then, if that wasn't already enough misfortune, she impaled herself on a set of hanging antlers that were on display in the room below. Hunting. You see, Hedwig survived, but in horrific physical health. And what did Joachim do? Of course, he eschewed his wife's needs and headed back to Anacido so he could carry on the hunt. The thing is, though, Joachim and Hedwig had a son, Johan, who grew up throughout this whole ordeal with a burning hatred for Anacido. Eventually, Joachim grew ill and passed away, but on his deathbed, he made his son Johan promise that he'd look after the one woman that he'd always loved. And no. Not his mother Hedwig, but instead, Anacido. As his father died, Johan promised that he would, but the next day he instead ordered his men to capture Anna, where he imprisoned her in the Spando fortress of Germany. And by imprisonment, I mean that Johan walled her in alive beneath a small staircase in the western wing of the castle, where she presumably starved to death and died, and now haunts the spot for all eternity. Yeah. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the tale of the Hundprest. Now, as it's become apparent throughout this video, European history is rife with bizarre, terrifying and mysterious tales, but perhaps none of them are so clearly perfect to be a horror film than the tale of the Hundprest, as written in the 1198 record of English history from William of Newburgh, A History of English Affairs. As the tale goes, there was once a chaplain who wasn't exactly the holiest of men. He drank, he feasted, and he, of course, loved to hunt. Because of 
this, he earned the nickname the Hund Press, the Dog Priest. Eventually, he died and was buried as a holy man in the monastery of Melrose, but it's seen that even death couldn't stop the Hunderpressed. On many nights, his corpse would rise from its grave and wander the town, where one night it came across a woman that he'd had relations with when he was alive. Obviously, the undead skeletal fiend was still smitten with her and made its way to her bedchambers. Obviously, the Hun Press was chased back to its grave, but that didn't stop it, and the lady soon became plagued by the ghoul every single night. She was unable to deter the undead chaplain and had soon become quite the terrifying problem. Distraught, she enlisted the help of a young friar and a few other men to somehow put an end to the Hun Press. You see, that very night, the friar camped out at the cemetery, and when midnight struck, the other men who'd accompanied him had given up, given the fact that it was a cold and damp evening. But as soon as they wandered off, the Hunderpressed had risen from its grave, set about to attack the friar in all its undead gore, ripping at the young man with his bones and claws. Somehow though, the young friar had a burst of courage and attacked the Hunderpressed with his axe, striking it hard deep into his body. And it worked, and the Hunderpressed fled back to its tomb, sealed back for the night. But the friar wasn't done with it just yet, and as dawn rose, him and his men opened the tomb of the Hunderpressed to find the exact spot where the friar had wounded him, seeping with a vile black sludge flowing with undead gore from the sepulchre. As William of Newburgh later noted, the men took one look at the Hunderpressed and burned the body to ash, where they scattered him to the winds. And that's from a history book, guys, from 1198. You wouldn't think it, right? Well, there we have it, horror fans, our part two list for the top five creepiest tales from European history. What do you guys think? Do you agree? Do you have any more that you'd like to add? Why don't you let us know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Before we depart from today's video though, let's first take a quick look at some of your more resounding remarks from over the past few days. First up, Caleb Leland says, I would gladly draw up a Cannibal Neanderthals album cover if we could get Jack to wear it on a t-shirt on here. Make it happen, Caleb, make it happen. If you do, I will happily wear a Cannibal Neanderthals shirt. They're already my favorite fictional death metal band. And then Ninja Fish says, just for you, Jack, I'm naming my band Cannibal Neanderthals. Well, it's settled then. And Caleb can make you a, an album cover already. Just make sure you send me a t-shirt, right? And I will happily wear it. Cannibal Neanderthals. You heard it here first, guys. Archaeological death metal. My favourite genre of music. Well, on that note, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for in today's video. Just stick around all the way until the end. If you were a fan of this video, or just top five scary videos in particular, then please be a D and hit that thumbs up button, as well as that subscribe bell. As per usual, I've been your horror host, Jack Finch. You'll be watching top five scary videos. Until next time, you take it easy.